the University of, of Oklahoma Health Science Center. And uh, as most of you already know, the Dr. Sontag is the, the very well known, nationally and internationally very well known scientist in the field of the, his research, growth hormone, IGF-1, aging, and brain function. I met Dr. Sontag almost 17 years ago when I was uh, the senior postdoc slash research faculty and when we, the submit, our aging research group submit the program project and he visited as uh, the, the one of the, the, the review members. And since then, I have been very, very the lucky to have an opportunity to work with him and for his uh, the, the several the very exciting projects. And uh, I have much respect for the, his research and also the, I have much respect for the, his great personality as well. So the, the today the after the lunch the, with the, the postdoc and the students, one of the postdoc they stopped by my office and he said, well, Dr. Sontag is a, is a very good scientist. So I told him, you are wrong. He is one of the best, if not the best, scientists I've, I've oh. ever... <laughs> I've, I, I, I've Wait, ever... I need to get my cell phone out now and, uh, yeah. and, and record this so I can tell my... Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then the... The Dr. Sontag has been the, 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 the very successful, the long time the research, the, the, faculty, the, the faculty members in the Wake Forest University School of Medicine. And uh, then now that he's the director of the aging research group, very good aging research group in the, the University of, of Oklahoma. And he liked the Wake Forest and uh, then the he, 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 he has been there for a long time and uh, ha having the successful scientific career. But there was a one issue. I think I talked this the, the episode uh, the last time he visited, but I want to repeat just in case you haven't heard about this. He likes the Wake Forest, the basketball team. <laughs> and he likes the, the college basketball the too much. And because of that, the before the game or the during the game, he can watch the game. And his blood pressure goes sky high, and then his heart rate is the faster than anybody could have. So one day that he thought he may not be able to take that kind of stress the rest of his life. So he decided to move to Oklahoma. And then they took the director job. And he doesn't need to worry about much about the, the college basketball. Well, there was another issue popped up. That after he moved to the Oklahoma City, Oklahoma City had the, the acquired the Oklahoma Thunder for the, as an NBA basketball team. But he doesn't need to worry about it. <laughs> the, the reason is, no matter how great that their team is, Oklahoma Thunder cannot pass the Western Conference Finals <laughs> because of the presence of the greatest team ever, our San Antonio Spurs. Well, and uh, welcome, and uh, today's his talk is an uh, insight into the protective effect of IGF-1 on the aging brain. Dr. Sontag. Yuji, thank you very much. Um, there's two things I'd like to say in response to those comments. First is that Tim Duncan is from Wake Forest, thank you very much, and you, you have Wake Forest to thank that he's now here. I forgot what the second thing was, see, but there, there was another thing. See, this is what happens when people get old. You know, they have two things to say and they remember one. Okay, so um, um, anyway, um, what I'd like to do today is to talk a little bit of in, in a global type of fashion about growth hormone and IGF-1. And I'm going to be a little bit on the controversial side. I thought it was coming up, up here to say, Bill, that's enough. <laughs> okay. Um, and what I'm going to do today is, how did growth hormone and IGF-1 become such a complex area of work? So we're going to talk um, a, a little bit of, of, 
about this field and the work that's been done. And um, then we're going to uh, go from there into just a review of the axis as a whole, the effects of deficiency of growth hormone in IGF-1, the vasculature, the brain, and the bone. Uh, we're going to talk ab about a recent study that my lab staff is so excited about. It, it, is, it is a lifespan study. 700 animals are involved, and we have eight animals left. And so they're going to have a party at the very end when they necropsy the, the last one. So that's coming. And so, and then res, uh, try to make some comments about where we go with the growth hormone IGF-1 field as a whole, which I think is really um, a, a very timely thing to do. First of all, um, Studies of growth hormone in IGF-1 before 1994 and 1995 were very straightforward. Growth hormone was good for you, okay? Taking growth hormone goes down as a function of age. You take more, you feel better. A muscle mass goes up, it helps with bone function. The world is right, okay? Um, it, it is a classical endocrine pathway, okay? Um, however, then uh, uh, Cynthia Kenyon came out, Andy Dillon as well, there's others, uh, that have found that the CL in the C. elegans pathway, if you antagonize the insulin IGF-1 pathway, and it's a common pathway there, that those animals are longer lived. Then uh, we had similar findings in flies, and we had the studies that uh, Andre Barkey has done and uh, Rich, Rich Miller as well, showing in the Ames dwarf, the Snell dwarf, and the growth hormone re receptor knockout, those animals are longer lived. I'm not arguing their data. Their data is solid, it is good, so please know that, okay? Um, there are other models that are out there as well that either would support the fact that lower levels of growth hormone or IGF-1 lead to a longer life, or that they don't, okay? It depends upon what tissue um, you're really talking about, the specific kinds of changes. We've done work in a dwarf rat. And uh, we th think this is a, a fairly good a model. Um, uh, uh, but uh, we found that a deficiency of growth hormone in IGF-1 had no effects on lifespan, OK? And so here we have all these controversial data that are out there. But despite the facts that these controversies are out there, the main concept that has evolved is that, oh, growth hormone and IGF-1 are a conserved mechanism of aging, okay? And I don't know whether you've thought about that. What does that mean, okay, to you to say that this pathway is a conserved mechanism of, of, um, of aging? And to me, at least, what it means is worms, flies, dwarf rats, normal rats, uh, mice, and people, okay, if there's a deficiency in growth hormone in IGF-1, it's an anti-aging intervention, okay? That would be the global type. We could have caveats there, all right, of what that actually means, okay? It could be tissue-specific or not, but does it have an effect on, 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 on a lifespan? Well, um, we did some calculations um, a, a, a while back in a review paper, and uh, the length of time that a wild-type animal lives is shown in this gray bar right here. And the growth hormone re receptor knockout is shown here. That's a longer-lived strain. Uh, the Ames dwarf is a longer-lived strain. The Snell dwarf is a longer-lived strain. You would think that if this is, this is a conserved mechanism, that uh, knockout of the receptor for growth hormone would lead to longer life in people. It doesn't. 
okay? Let me repeat that. It doesn't. Despite what people tell you or say, the evidence is not there. I have never seen any convincing data that people that with a deficiency of growth hormone or IGF-1 are longer lived or that they are healthier. Can I yeah. So you mentioned if the receptor is not there. Mm -hmm. Could it be, is it the receptor or is it the actual hormone level? Could the hormone levels be working through other mechanisms? Maybe Potentially. Okay, um, but if the receptor for growth hormone is knocked out, then IGF-1 levels are low, growth hormone levels are up. In the Ames dwarf, growth hormone and IGF-1 levels are low and a number of other factors that are there. And in the Hanel dwarf as well, it's pituitary growth hormone, prolactin, and TSH that is down. Okay, and so it, you do have caveats in this pathway, and you have to be aware of the pathway itself, and we'll talk about that, okay? And so we're, we're going to dissect how the pathway works and look at various tissues and how they respond to a deficiency of growth hormone and IGF-1. And that's a really good point, because at times you will see me refer to them as GH slash IGF-1. And when I, when I do that, I'm talking about, we can't tell the difference, because they're both going down or both going up, okay? However, there are times when we can distinguish those pathways. It doesn't mean we know what we're doing, because one's going down and one's going up, and you can get biological effects from that, but it, it's a... It's a complicated pathway, and it's even a lot more complicated that, than that. So let me just get, get through this, okay? So um, the bottom line is people, the, uh, in one, one of the large studies, in, the relatively large studies that was done is in the Ecuadorian dwarfs. And their median lifespan is here. We would expect, if we have a conserved mechanism of aging here, if they responded like everything else, they should be long-lived. They should live to about 120. They don't, okay? Um, the life expectancy of uh, the population in uh, Ecuador is shown here, and these people live less than other people in that country, okay? Um, and uh, so, that's an important point. And if you look at the data, um, there's this, uh, the people, or at least some of the people that are in this study. As we expect, they are short because they have a deficiency of growth hormone, a constitutive deficiency of growth hormone from birth. So during uh, the adolescence, phase, uh, they don't show a rise in growth hormone or IGF-1, they don't grow, there's other problems as, as well, but, you know, they are short for the, um, and here is a lifespan curve here showing the control animals, and the reason that they said the uh, individuals are the longer lived are because of these two points right there. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, I mean, I, I I have a problem not with data, I have a problem with interpretation, okay? Then uh, we show up here why the animals died, this is important, and so as we would ex uh, might expect, there's uh, um, really, I I'm sorry, let me make sure I know which one is which. The dwarf uh, folks are over here, the growth hormone deficient folks are over here, um, and uh, cancer Risk has gone down. We would expect that from the effects of growth, uh, having a deficiency of growth hormone in IGF-1. Uh, the number of accidents goes way up. Um, I could make a joke, but I will not, okay? Um, but, you know, we don't know um, really the extent of the pathological changes that are going on here. We have these crude de determinations of, of what's happening. As uh, interest as well, the number of convulsive problems goes up when you have a deficiency of growth hormone in IGF-1. And 
um, I would suspect that would mean that you have some kind of a uh, problem with brain function, but we will go there in just a bit. So uh, again, you know, part of the uh, uh, concern that I have is we need to be careful what we call a conserved mechanism of, um, of, of aging. And so if it doesn't, if it's not applicable to people, then is it conserved or not? And we could argue that point. Now, let's go in after that introduction and we get the controversy out of the, the way. Let's talk about the regulation of growth hormone and IGF-1. A lot of you will already know this, and, uh, and I'll talk about the strategies that we use to, to study the uh, uh, growth hormone IGF-1 axis. This is the axis that we're talking about. Pituitary growth hormone uh, is here. It's controlled by GHRH output, growth hormone, releasing hormone output from the hypothalamus. It's inhibited by uh, uh, by, um, by somatostatin. Uh, the dynamic interchange between these two hormones leads to a pulsatile pattern of growth hormone output beginning around adolescence. Um, uh, and growth hormone will circulate in blood, binds to hepatic cells that produce IGF-1. So the vast majority of the circulating IGF-1 is from a hepatic source. Um, that is, the IGF-1 is bound primarily to IGF-BP3, uh, and then it gets to a tissue-specific site, and uh, there are binding proteins here in the tissue as well that can serve, that can serve to stimulate or block IGF-1 act, activity at the tissue site. In addition, um, uh, tissue can make its own IGF-1 which is a very under-investigated area of work, and I will tell you why I think that's really important towards the end of the talk. We really have not investigated the dynamics between endocrine IGF-1 and paracrine IGF-1. We have not done it well. We've ignored it. It's time to stop that, okay? Because a lot of, of the responses we see in the tissue may be due to paracrine IGF-1 independent of endocrine IGF-1. And this may be very important for the dwarf animal lines and why they live so long. And we'll feed back into is this a conserved mechanism of aging or not? So, yeah. How many isoforms of IGF-1 are there? Good question, controversial. <laughs> um, uh, IGF-1 is a complex gene. It has multiple start sites and multiple exons are involved. Depending on who you talk to, uh, Martin Adamo, is, um, is he still around? Is he, is he still here? All right. Um, Martin would be the person, would, would be the expert in, in this area of the isoforms of IGF-1. Certainly, the peptide that's made, the structure is, is always the same. The uh, mRNA that's made has uh, different start sites, and so the complexity of that is not well understood. Okay, and there's the possibility, and I think Martin would agree with me, the possibility of a small peptide coming off as a cleaved product of one of the isoforms, as you would call it, of IGF-1. The support for that is very mixed, okay, so. Yes. Is there any possibility some of the animal, like the dwarf animal or the, some the, this growth hormone receptor knockout mice, they may have the certain type of the compensation to, 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 to develop, the, continuously develop the, the, the tissue and the body after the, their birth the, through the potentially the, the upregulation of the, the IGF-2? Um, IGF-2 is a very important topic that, believe it or not, has not been investigated well with age at all by us or anybody else that, that, uh, that I know of. 
Um, it, it does play a role in brain function. It is high uh, before birth and comes down after birth. Um, and Well, it's still high until kids are about 9 or 10. Uh, you, you probably would know this better than, uh, than I. As IGF-1 starts to go up, IGF-2 is falling down. Okay, and so there's this crosstalk. I don't want to say crosstalk as if they're, you know, but that um, the exchange between growth uh, between IGF-1 and IGF-2 is present. Okay, as far as the concentrations in blood, but we don't know, you know, about IGF-2 concentrations in the dwarf animals. But that's an excellent point that we just haven't gotten to yet. So, bottom line. We have these pulses of growth hormone. This is a study we did a long time ago. Um, and uh, we have pulses of growth hormone in animals that are young. This uh, is a uh, Sprague Dolly rat. We see the same kind of pulses in Fisher 344 or Fisher 344 Brown Norway cross. Uh, these pulses occur every three and a half hours or so. They are not a synchronized pulse, uh, but they do kind of group uh, together between rats in more or less uh, some kind of a fashion. There is a Zeitgeber with the lights out, which is shown here. So almost all the animals show this pulse. This is a coordinated pulse that, that occurs. And with age, and these animals happen to be uh, 22 months of age, there's a decline in the amplitude of uh, these growth hormone pulses. And so this is what leads to a deficiency of insulin-like growth factor one. The amplitude of the growth hormone pulses go down. The hepatic secretion of IGF-1 goes down. So when we look at IGF-1, and I did this stylized view of changes in IGF-1 throughout the lifespan, and of course, it's not real, okay? This is not how IGF-1 actually looks, but you know, for my purposes here, uh, 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 before adolescence occurs, before, be, before puberty occurs, we have lower levels of IGF-1 that then come up as puberty uh, occurs, and then at that point, sometime after that point, we have a decrease that occurs with age. The extent of that decrease depends upon the species, the strain, um, sex, everything else, okay? And so it can be as much as 50%. We've seen that in a number of our animal strains. It can be as low as 20%, okay, of the circulating IGF-1. Now, part of the questions that we ask are, what can we do? How can we test this and see whether or not growth hormone or IGF-1 has a biological action? Uh, with age, we can give growth hormone re replacement. That's very easy to do. We just inject growth hormone two times a day. Once per day doesn't, eh, doesn't really do it well because you need that somewhat of a pulsatile pattern okay, in, in order to really show the uh, acceptable rise in insulin-like growth factor one. And so indeed, we can do that. We can give growth hormone replacement and then look at what's the physiology that's downstream from that. What, are, what phenotype have, have we changed? Okay, um, and then we can ask, uh, I think, more complicated questions th th than that. Because we can go in, depending upon the models that we have, and look at is there a, 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 what is the importance of the adolescent rise in IGF-1? That's a relevant question to ask, beca because there may be an organizational action of IGF-1 on the brain, on the tissue, um, uh, an epigenetic effect. We don't know. Okay. Uh, the growth hormone receptor knockout, the Ames dwarf and the Sunel dwarfs, their levels of IGF-1 uh, stay ar around here, extremely low. Um, we can ask a question after the animal has shown this adolescent surge of insulin-like growth factor 1, what is the effect of adult onset deficiency of IGF-1? And I think that's a very important question to ask from an aging point of view because we want the animal to develop normally if our question is related 
to does this have any the meaning for an older rat or an older person, the, the deficiency, then we don't want to do a knockout before birth. Okay, it's, you know, you're impairing the develop, the normal developmental processes that are happening. The, our question is related to what is the consequence of a decrease that is occurring. And so that's exactly what we can do here. We can take an IGF-1 floxed mouse and we can go in with a hepatic specific viral vector that we inject one shot and that will target hepatic cells. It has a Per promoter of a gene that's only expressed in hepatic cells, and it will knock out the IGF-1 gene. And we can do that, and we can get a nice decrease in IGF-1 that is comparable to, it is not identical to, the age-related changes in IGF-1 that we see. In addition, we could expand that even more. We could look at, we could make a deficiency of IGF-1 out here and then restore it. There's a lot of games that could be played. We don't play them all, okay? But, you know, it is possible to, to do that with the genetic models that, that are out there. So, with that in mind, um, uh, globally, what, you know, historically has been that the beneficial uh, effects of uh, growth hormone IGF-1 are an increase in bone mass, insulin secretion, uh, brain function, and I should say this is increase in the development of the beta cell, okay? Uh, animals that are deficient in uh, growth hormone in IGF-1 have an impaired development of beta cells. Um, uh, there's uh, effects on brain function, reproductive function, cardiovascular function, and the proliferation of cells. This is just what the hormone does. It's been well known for years since we first found the, uh, uh, its structure. Uh, early deficits um, uh, ha will, uh, uh, in uh, growth hormone IGF-1, increase lifespan. And I don't know. Um, I don't know why I put that under the deleterious effects. I do apologize for that. That may not be a deleterious effect. Uh, but it does increase cancer risk, okay? And so um, if uh, we give growth hormone IGF-1, its effects on cells are, are to cause cellular growth, okay? It, it increases cancer risk. So there has to be this fine balance between levels of growth hormone IGF-1 in the blood. We would expect and shouldn't be surprised at all if we take an animal that is overexpressing growth hormone in IGF-1 in a pathological way, a constitutive secretion, these animals must be shorter lived and die of cancer. That is, uh, you know, I mean, that is very consistent with, you know, the changes that we would ex expect after excess of growth hormone or IGF-1. At the same time, if we have a, a, a if the hormone is gone, we, sh we should expect uh, animals that are very small, they don't grow, they will not be functional in the wild, okay? Because you need the hormone for the animals to grow up to compete in the cold crew world, okay? So that's what the hormone does. Those are the global aspects of the way we look at the, at the, at the, at, uh, at this hormone. So, okay, let's chat a little bit more. Uh, yeah. So, has someone tested the effect of a growth hormone blocker, receptor blocker? Yes, but it's not a complete blocker. It's not 100%, okay? Uh, that was done by John uh, um, Kupchik did, did those studies. He has an antagonist of uh, the receptor for GH, and indeed it does decrease cancer risk, okay? And it also, ha depending upon the, uh, on the strain and the sex, has a very modest effect on how long the animals live, okay? Uh, but that was uh, the animal expressed this gene that was the endogenous antagonist of growth hormone. Okay, um, and so, um, you know, there are studies here that show that if you have a deficiency of growth hormone, that the animals are uh, the longer lived, 
and there are studies that show that, uh, 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 um, that in rodents, that the dwarf um, uh, various models um, show a uh, beneficial effect of um, uh, growth hormone in IGF-1, depending upon our interpretation and the tissue-specific effects. So um, let's go on and talk about the vascular effects, the cognitive effects, and the effects on bone. Now, Zoltan Ungvari was here a couple weeks ago, and I'm sure he bored you to death with all the vascular effects. I'll just cover a few of those, but, and we may have a couple of the same slides here because a lot of these studies were done in conjunction with, with him. But let's start off by talking about the general effects of IGF-1 on brain. Certainly, uh, the basic concept that we started with is, is to say, all right, does IGF-1 have an effect on brain function? It's a very simple question to ask. Does circulating effect of IGF-1 alter the cognitive changes that occur with age? And we can study that as actually a very straightforward study to do. In a the Morris maze, you're taking animals that, that are young, and you're looking at their performance in this task and uh, they're trying to find a hidden platform. Uh, they learn that task, and then you take the platform away, and you look and see how much time they spend around where the platform used to be, um, which is the annulus 40 time, and the number of platform crossings are shown here. That's the time that they go directly over where the platform was. It's the accuracy of them being able to find that platform. Okay, it's a classical test that's done in rats. Um, we don't like to do this task in, in, um, in the mice uh, because the mice normally don't like water. Okay, so we have other tasks that we use for the mice. Anyway, animals that are old, of course, as we expect, their cognitive function deteriorates. They don't do this task as well. If we infuse IGF-1 directly into the brain for 28 days, uh, they have an improvement in their cognitive ability. And that's the same here. Uh, this was the annulus 40 time. The number of platform crossings are shown here. Again, the decrease with age recovered by giving a hormone back. Very classical studies, um, and so very straightforward, and I think the interpretation is straightforward as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Such as oligodendrocyte or the normal the one of the type of the astrocyte. Do you really think that this is the direct effect to the neuronal function or the going through the diabetes? You've been studying. <laughs> You've been reading and thinking about where we're going. But yes to um, well, let me re rephrase that. I if I said it was the specific effects on neurons, I, w I was in error doing that. What I would say, it's, it's a specific effect on brain, okay? And so we're having a compound come in and somehow through some a mechanism, it's improving cognitive function, okay? How that works is part of what I'm going to talk about. We still don't have a specific answer for you, but I think we're getting a little bit closer. And the difficulty we have is I think it has many effects, not just one. Okay, so, but we'll chat about that more. So, um, yeah, Jim. Do you look at many other behavioral parameters? Not at this point, no. Since this time, in the other models we have, we've looked at uh, depression, which uh, is, or the correlates of depression uh, that we use. And that uh, goes up as a function of age and is reversed in part by IGF-1. I'm a little bit more skeptical of those tests. You know, um, you know they're more, there's more stress involved with those, and I get a little bit nervous about interpretation. Okay, but this is, you know, is the classical test for c cognitive function. Yeah, sure. Oh, oh, act, act, 
activity. One uh, piece of data we can get from this test is uh, the rate at which the animals swim. Um, we've also looked at their activity in, in an open field, that kind of thing. The open field doesn't change their performance, uh, their, act, um, their rate at which they move decreases slightly with age um, and, is and uh, stays the same with uh, giving IGF-1 back. So in these two groups, there's not a performance effect, okay? Um, and so that's why we actually look at endpoints like platform, uh, the number of crossings that are there, or the annulus 40 time, because those are independent of performance. Shelly. You mentioned that you just asked there about the training age phase and infusing the birth That's correct. How Well, um, these studies were originally done by, uh, by Alicia Markoska at Hopkins. She actually did a test at 14 days and then again at 28 days. The 14 days showed trends for changes, okay? Uh, we kept the infusions going. We replaced those pumps because they were 14-day pumps. And then we went to 28 days, okay? She tested again and uh, found r robust effects. So it looks like um, they are beginning to occur by 14 days and are robust by tw uh, one month. So it's not a change in some kind of signaling action Yeah. Proliferation Yes. Okay, so. I'm sorry? No, we did not. It was expensive, okay? And so we couldn't afford to do it. We were buying the IGF-1 at the time and, uh, you know, say, <laughs> don't want to go there. Uh, what would have been neat to do and would still be nice is to see, uh, let the pumps go and then test after four more weeks and see w whether the behavior went, went back. Okay, we've never done that, okay? We have also done tests where we have injected growth hormone twice a day for three months, and so we're increasing the circulating IGF-1, and that has the same effect. We have done a study uh, that my lab techs still uh, hate me for, where we started injecting at eight months of age and injected two times a day until the, the animals were 22 months of age uh, with GHRH, which is the peptide that drives gr growth hormone uh, up. And um, that also had an effect. It, was, it prevented the age-related decline in cognitive function. So all three work as long as we're restoring plasma levels of growth hormone in IGF-1 and uh, with the assumption that the IGF-1 is being transported through the brain, uh, which it does, okay? There's data out there that clearly shows that. Okay, now, with the models we have, what we would suspect is that if we do an artificial reduction in IGF-1 that we get a similar effect. And one of the first studies we did in some of the tests of our, uh, of our viral vectors was to look at changes in IGF-1. Here we have the control animals up here that are injected with GFP, with a viral vector containing GFP. And here is the um, uh, changes in IGF-1 in an animal that was injected with MUPCRI. MUP is a specific uh, gene that's only expressed in hepatic cells. So we're knocking out IGF-1 in hepatic cells. We're decreasing the levels of IGF-1. And we're getting about a 50% change in IGF-1 with the dosage that we use, and which is comparable to what we would expect with age. We are not wiping out IGF-1, and so this is not an absence of IGF-1. And doing an active avoidance test, this is after, uh, on the second day, you know, how fast the animals will move. Uh, animals that are young do this task very well. Animals. It, I, I, Animals that are young and injected with the control virus do this test well, and animals that are young and injected with a hepatic specific CRE to knock IGF-1 down are, uh, do this test poorly. Now, um, 
In addition, I talked to you about paracrine IGF-1 and how important that we think that the local expression, secretion of IGF-1 is at the tissue site. So we have this endocrine IGF-1 and a paracrine IGF-1. And so we've been controlling endocrine IGF-1. Okay, that's what, what we've been going after for some time. But now with an animal that's floxed, we have the ability to control both. We can inject a viral vector that's hepatic specific to knock endocrine down by 50%. We can then go into the brain and give a viral vector that uh, if, affects cells in specific regions of brain and knock the expression of IGF-1 down there. So we can wipe out the, or knock down, I should say, endocrine IGF-1 and the paracrine IGF-1, because we're concerned there might be a compensation. You knock down one, the other might change. And so this would be a reasonable thing for us to do. And what we found is we could inject our viral vector into CA1. Uh, this is a coronal view here, CA1 is right here, CA3 is here, and the dentate over here, and we could do one injection into the dentate, and the virus would spread all along CA1. It's normal? It's what? Is it a neuronal? No, it is not. It is not specific, but the virus itself, the AAV9, appears to specifically affect neurons. The promoter is not specific, okay? And we're developing other ones now because what we want to do in the future to address uh, the question that was brought up before is to pull apart neuronal from astrocyte, from glia, from smooth muscle cells. You know, I mean, where's it being made? Uh, which one is important? What, what is the consequence of, because IGF-1 is made by them all, okay? And so we just don't know the proportion, what's secreted, you know, you know, it just becomes a black box that we need to slowly begin to dissect out. So we can do this, and so we can knock um, IGF-1 down here or out in the paracrine uh, source, and then we can go in and look at um, uh, uh, a, a different behavioral task. This happens to be the Barnes maze, uh, and so uh, you, p you put a mouse on a, on a platform, there's a number of holes, and uh, underneath one of the holes is a way they get out of the uh, openness of the platform. And so they will search for that and they will go into this cage. It's a fairly non, fairly non stressful um, uh, cognitive test. And so you can look at their ability to learn where that, uh, uh, wh where the es escape hole is. You can uh, look at, at the search patterns that they have. Uh, and then you can take the drawer out very much like a Morris maze and see how long they stay ar around where that escape hole um, should be, okay? So uh, with that, we, can, we have an acquisition curve over here. We have our control. We have brain Cree, and we have both hepatic and brain Cree. So we can take, uh, knock the the. the the brain IGF-1 out and just look at the ability of endocrine to compensate, or we can knock both out and see what the consequence of that is. When we do that, we get a, uh, a decrease. This was not a, it's a trend, not a, a significant change in uh, uh, time on target here. Or with the brain cree, when we knock them both out as I would expect, um, they, uh, the performance goes down more. And so it's reiterating again the importance of IGF-1 for cognitive function, okay? Now, um, let's go back to rat for just a little bit because we can do something special in rats that we cannot do in, in, um, in a mice and that's we can behaviorally classify rats and pull them apart when they're older by their cognitive ability. Rats, just like people, when they get older, some people lose their cognitive ability, some don't, okay? Some do very well on the Morris maze, some don't, okay? 
And so this is performance of animals that are young. These are older rats. These are, we're calling these older intact because their performance is very close to what we'd see in animals that are young. And then we have older rats that are impaired. This is a, is a natural event. We get this about 50% of the animals we test fall in each of these categories, OK? And so it, it's a natural uh, way the animals are just pulled apart on this task. Every once in a while, we'll see animals that are in the middle here, and so we don't use those, OK? And so we make this artificial change between aged intact and aged impaired. And then we can do a whole bunch of things. We can look at cerebral blood flow. We can look at uh, expression of various genes. And we can ask, what pulls aged intact from aged impaired apart? And one thing, one of the first things we did is to look at uh, cerebral blood flow. This was done by both bold analysis and by fair analysis. Don't ask me. Uh, that was a few, uh, a few years ago, and so what fair analysis is, I just know it took us a long time to do it. Um, but with age, there's a decline in blood flow regardless of their cognitive ability. Those animals that uh, uh, are impaired have a further reduction in cerebral blood flow. So it seems to be this progressive effect that's going on. And we can do a fairly decent correlation between perfusion of blood to brain and their cognitive ability. I didn't think that this would work very well, but look, the mean proximity to platform here and the perfusion here, very disparate dependent variables that are correlate very well. So anyway. so. And uh, this gets back to a slide that Dr. Mvari probably showed, and that the brain has a lot of stuff in it. It has a lot of vasculature. Um, the vasculature is rich. And he would say, and I don't know whether this is right, but I believe about 80% of, of what he says. Um, no, I believe more than that. OK, I hope he's not listening. <laughs> um, uh, that every neuron has its own uh, vessel. Now, I don't know how they calculated that. It seems, you know, boy, I, I'd hate to have to calculate that. I'm glad I don't have to calculate it. Suffice it to say that there's a lot of blood vessels in brain. And as you know, blood is important for neuronal function. Okay, you, as neurons work, you know, they, they, you know, they need oxygen, they need glucose, uh, you need to remove all the byproducts, everything else. Not having blood vessels is not a good idea. You need them, okay? And so, um, you know, and there's a tremendous amount in brain. So what happens as we get older? And one of the things that happens is a rarefaction of the blood vessels that are there. This is a study that I did at Wake Forest with a talented person that was able to, to take the skull off the surface of brain, put a window in its place, and then uh, follow what happens and record over specific areas of brain what's happening over time. And these uh, windows are patent for up to three months, OK? Um, you know, the dura starts to regrow and, it, and, it, and you will lose your visual field. But in a lot of animals, they're patent for about three months. Okay, with age, there's a big decline. There's a rarefaction in the amount of blood vessels on the surface of the brain. We aren't looking in depth now, okay? We're just looking at the surface of brain. And the interesting thing about the surface of the brain is the peel vessels that are there come over the surface of the brain and they dive down. And so you can't see those up here, um, you know, because they're the very tiny ones that we'd have to do a, the magnification of. But you can count them, okay? Because going, 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 gone. Okay, and you can see them at a particular size dive down into the cortex. Okay, that's how the cortex is fed. And with age, there's a decline in the uh, a number of arterioles that are there. The connections between them and the venules as well are all decreasing with age. And in fact, when we give growth hormone back, 
we can go over this area of brain, we inject growth hormone for 30 days, and then go back after 30 days to the same area of brain, look down and say, how many vessels are there? And it's an easy thing to do. It's the cheap man's way to do an angiogenic assay. And lo and behold, vessels go up in older animals that you're giving growth hormone back to. They really don't change in animals that are young or older animals injected with saline. So again, growth hormone, potentially through IGF-1, is having an angiogenic effect in brain. So somehow it's restoring uh, the loss of blood vessels that are there. The, it's a matter of the brain controls its own blood flow. It is not a collapsed blood vessel like you would see in a, a, um, the muscle, okay, that's not used and then is used when you exercise. These are always open, and what the brain does is it's controlling the diameter of those blood vessels to control its own blood flow, okay? That's what the brain does, and it, uh, and, uh, and so the size of the vessels we're talking about here would always be there. They would always be the visible to us, okay? So they have to be new ones, okay? Now, in addition to the vessels that are there, the larger vessels, we can go down and look at, at, at the capillaries. And uh, indeed, we can go in and look in young inje animals injected with saline, older animals injected with saline, or older animals injected with GH, and look at specific areas of the hippocampus. When we do that, uh, what we find is uh, that growth hormone causes a rise in the capillaries as well, an increase in the density of capillaries. Uh, in CA1, uh, we got a decrease with age that we didn't get, I'm sorry, in CA3, we got a trend towards a decrease with age that we didn't see in CA1, but uh, it's recovered by giving growth hormone. And in the dentate, we have a trend for more vessels there. Again, this is 30 days of peripheral injections of growth hormone, okay? Um, it, it, they're still in a physiological range. Okay, so their IGF-1 values are increased, but they're increased to the levels of animals that are young. These are not pathological changes in IGF-1. In addition, um, I'll quickly go through a couple of things that we've done on the vasculature with, with, uh, with the young, young Bari laboratory. And because they can take vessels throughout the body, and they can look at oxidative stress. And what they do is they look at uh, DHE, they use other endpoints as well, but we can look at those in control animals and animals that are flocks that we then knock out the circulating IGF-1, and when the, uh, that really doesn't change at baseline, um, uh, the amount of oxidative stress, but you put a stressor on top of that, uh, high glucose or an oxidized LDL, then you see in the control animals, oxidative stress goes up, but animals that don't have uh, or have a reduction in IGF-1 have more oxidative stress. And so the cells are hyper-responding to the challenge. They're producing more oxidative stress in response to that challenge. And uh, the same thing is true, I'm just going to glance by, by this one for caspase uh, 3 and, and 7, uh, the fragmentation of DNA, all are consistent with this protective effects of uh, IGF-1 on the vasculature. Um, in addition, uh, Zoltan has done a lot of studies with NERF-2, and so when uh, uh, in the activation of the, the NERF-2, this is part of the antioxidant defense pathway. And so when we give IGF-1 back, there's more activation of NERF-2. And when we give IGF-1 back, 
there's more activation of the downstream targets of NERF2, the NQO1, HMOX1, and GCLC. Um, and so all of those are increased in response to IGF-1. This is done in, in, uh, in cell culture. Um, and then in another study, again, looking at uh, the viral vector knockdown of circulating IGF-1, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, we're going after the IGF-1 flocks with the mup Cree. And uh, the uh, changes in uh, uh, NERF2 in animals that are deficient in IGF-1, they have an impaired expression of NERF2 shown there. And of course, the circulating IGF-1 drops by uh, about 40% or so. And then you can look at the downstream targets of uh, NERF2 as well. And those are all down in response to the challenge of high glucose or peroxide. And so again, IGF-1 having this uh, uh, appears to be a protective effect on the vasculature. Um, and then he's done studies as well looking at the integrity of the blood-brain barrier. And uh, we're looking at transport across the blood-brain barrier here in, uh, in control animals, animals that are, that are hypertensive the control animals that are deficient in IGF-1 and the uh, animals uh, uh, that are deficient in IGF-1 that have hypertension. And so hypertension, the effects of hypertension are observed when we have a deficiency of IGF-1, or at least in, in, uh, uh, as a consequence of changes in uh, uh, breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. Now, um, uh, in another study, we've used the, the dwarf rat, okay? That's the dwarf rat there. Um, and again, these animals as well show an uh, uh, increased uh, oxidative stress in their vessels. And when we give growth hormone back, that goes back down. So again, in another species, in another uh, uh, animal that's deficient in growth hormone, um, giving growth hormone or IGF-1 back has a beneficial action. In addition, uh, he's shown the same thing in the Ames dwarf, okay? And, uh, and that was uh, uh, published, uh, I think, around 2007 or so. Now, I told you before that IGF-1 depending upon how you do it, can increase the lifespan or decrease it. And that's absolutely true. Um, when we did a study in the dwarf rat, and this is an animal that naturally shows adult onset deficiency of growth hormone and IGF-1. And so the animal grows up. It's not uh, reduced in size at all until around around puberty. And then at that point, it does not show the high amplitude growth hormone pulses. And uh, uh, the animal is deficient in IGF-1 starting around 28, 29 days of age. You, you, you will see those graphs start to pull apart. But we can study that animal and said, does adult onset deficiency of growth hormone have an effect on how long the animals live? And the answer to that question is absolutely not. They have identical lifespan curves. It doesn't matter whether you have a deficiency of growth hormone or IGF-1. Pathology matters, OK? They die of different things, but they die at exactly the same time of those different things, OK? So that's a really important finding. But then we went ahead and uh, we injected growth hormone back in for 10 weeks. So we give growth hormone back so they have a normal adolescent surge of uh, IGF-1. And then we stop. We leave the animals alone. They age the, the way they would. They die of the things that they normally would. And what surprised us is that these animals with replacement of growth hormone for just 10 weeks 
live three months longer, okay? 15% longer just because of something we did early during the lifespan. And then when we look, and that's shown here, okay, these are, 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 are the two curves. And then when we look at why the animals died, both these groups, about 50% of the animals are dying of intracerebral hemorrhage. Just so happens that when you replace with GH, they die of that later, okay? And this was done with uh, Dr. Kino, who looked at all of the tissues and everything else. So, you know, I didn't do it. It was his fault, okay? And so bottom line is that something we do during adolescence is having late life effects, okay? Why? We could argue that point. But we think that growth hormone and IGF-1 are having direct effects on the vessels in some way that it lasts a lifetime, okay? Now, we need more work on that. Um, okay, let's talk about a couple of other areas here. We talked about the effects of IGF-1 on brain. And certainly, um, you know, we've done studies before that I'm, uh, you know, I will not bore you with, where, and uh, we know that the number of, in, as animals age in a healthy way, number of, the neurons do not change. They are constant throughout the life unless you have Alzheimer's or some pathological change going on. Then, you know, you lose these cells. But in a normal brain, you don't, okay? In a normal aging animal, you don't lose any of the neurons with age. That's a fallacy that creeped into the field and was part of the field for years until they ruled that out. But what does change is the quality of the synapses that are there, okay? The connections between the cells. And so this was a study that, uh, that we did, and it was um, still when I was at Wake. Um, and we're looking at post synaptic density length, okay? And that's shown here, really doesn't change very much with age. But when you give IGF-1 back, and th these were the animals that were injected for 28 days, excuse me, infused for 28 days, you get an increase in the postsynaptic density length, okay? In addition, uh, if you look at MSB, number of synapses per neuron, that is dramatically affected by IGF-1. And so here's the effects of age shown here. When we give IGF-1 back, essentially we double that, okay? And so the number of multiple sp uh, spine boutons is going up, okay? And so somehow the complexity of those cells has improved. More connections are being made. And that is at least one of, of the big effects of IGF-1. Now, in another study, um, and I'm only, you know, for time purposes, I'm only going to show a couple of these, and then I'll, I'll is, skip over the rest, because the message is the same. We're looking at an entirely different pathway now. And these were done in a proteomic screen with a colleague of mine at uh, the was at Wake, then he was at Penn State, and now he's with us, okay? And so what Bill Freeman did is to take our rats that are cognitively intact and cognitively impaired, or young, okay? And that's shown here. And then he blindly went and said, what is different between these groups from a proteomics point of view, okay? And so he extracted that, and uh, what fell out very early during the studies was the um, no-go pathway, okay? Now, the fly people probably know what the no-go pathway is, but ah, I, I didn't, okay? But when neurons grow, uh, they grow to a certain extent, and then you have to turn on genes that stop the growth of those cells, and that's what a no-go actually does. And so it, it, it prunes the number of of synapses that are formed, 
Okay, that's what it does. And what Bill has found is that with age, the expression of NGR1, which is the receptor for a number of these compounds, uh, goes down in the animals that are aged intact. There's young, aged intact, and aged impaired. They goes up in the animals that are impaired, okay? And so he's looking at a, a synaptosomal prep here. He's looking at CA1, CA3, and the dentate. So really a fine distinction of multiple areas of an area of the brain that's important for learning and, and a memory. And then we can correlate NGR1, this receptor, to their cognitive performance in the Morris maze. And again, good correlations with their cognitive ability. And besides the receptor for these compounds, we can look at the actual peptides that bind the receptor as well. And we can look at um, no-go A, MAG, and MOG would be on the next page. Um, but decreases in aged intact and increased in animals that are impaired in almost every case. And so we're getting an activation of a pathway that's designed to prune the number of synapses that are there, and it's activated in the animals that are cognitively impaired. Now, is that controlled by IGF-1? Eh, I don't know yet, okay? We're, that's a work in progress. Here is OMGP, which is the third peptide bind, that binds to this receptor site, again showing uh, a decrease in aged intact and, in, in, and a reversal in animals that are impaired. So um, let's skip this and go to this, because I want to talk about this. Yes? Um, so you've, you've looked at the synapses. Do you think there's useless sprouting? So they don't actually oh, synapse? Only in my brain. <laughs> I have that problem all the time, okay? Yeah. Well, you know what it all you know, Energy is expended to sprout and nothing happens. Okay. <laughs> that, does that happen or is it just trying to and they're not responding, so the plasticity is lacking? Well, the plasticity is not there, okay? So and so, um, but you have this constant balance, you know, I mean, and we have not investigated this whole pathway, so. I'm going to hypothesize just a little bit that we have this continual outgrowth of um, the neurons that are there and the attempt to form connections. And c connections indeed are formed because the animals can learn, OK? Or the strength of the synapse can be increased, OK? Uh, but you have this pruning effect as well that's working against that. Mm -hmm. Stubby synapses. Okay. okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, can you talk about a neuroscience? <laughs> that's, that's okay. Before we move on to the, this, the next slide, how old are the, the animals you compare the old, the impaired, and the intact? 26 months of age. Those are Fisher 344 Brown Norway Cross. Okay. Have you let them uh, die and, uh, after the you, you compare the cognitive function? No. I'm just curious. If the, the, the cognitive... I, I need their brain, and, and they happen to uh, die as soon as I take their brain. It, it's the funniest thing, okay? Um, you know. <laughs> no, I mean, we, we, you know, I mean, I would love, I mean, I, I understand exactly the, the study you're thinking about. Are these animals longer lived? And I'd love to do that study, but we weren't funded to do that study. <laughs> so, you know, what we have to do, you know, um, we had to look at, at the brain, okay? So, uh, you know, okay. Um, okay, we have a lifespan study that's just about done, and I, uh, and I was telling you about that. And it's, you know, the, the concept for this was pretty straightforward. If deficiency of IGF-1 is good for you, are we going to make kids deficient in IGF-1? 
not going to happen because we want our basketball players. So the NBA would would be robbed. Okay, okay. Um, we, you know, I mean, we're not going to do that study. It's not translationally relevant. It will not happen. Okay. But what we can do, what might be a feasible thing to do, is to say people that are at risk for cancer, at high risk for cancer, can we make them deficient in IGF-1 and will that change how long they live? Okay, we know from studies we've done and other people as well that IGF-1 is the risk factor for cancer when we take dwarf animals and inject them with DMBA to induce uh, the mammary cancer. Um, uh, dwarf animals don't get mammary cancer. None of them. Zero. Okay, they don't respond to the DMBA. As soon as we give growth hormone back to drive IGF-1 up, it's a dose-dependent effect. The higher IGF-1, the more cancer we get. Okay, it's, it, it's a very reliable effect. It's done by people other than me. Uh, I use DMBA. Uh, Derek Leroy used a different drug. Okay, but you know, the end point is the same. The cancers are dependent upon the levels of IGF-1. So let's make animals that are older deficient in IGF-1, you know, um, and see what happens if they live a longer time. And that's what this study was designed to do. And so the, the graphics here, I have no idea how to do the graphics yet because it's a study kind of in progress still. But we have our wild type animals up here, so we have a group of those. We have an animal that is a lid mouse here is deficient in IGF-1 from birth, okay, uh, excuse me, postnatal day 15 when the albumin uh, is turned on, when the promoter for albumin is turned on, okay, and, and, and this is the control group for that one. Then we have an animal at five months of age uh, that's uh, floxed IGF-1, and we can inject with uh, TBG CRE now or TBG EGFP. Uh, that's still hepatic specific viral vector uh, that knocks I, I, circulating IGF-1 down. And so that's at five months of age. So they have normal levels of IGF-1 right up to five months of age. And then it, it drops in their load the rest of their life. And then we, at 15 months, we, we can take another cohort and uh, look at the differences between tbg Cree and tbg EGFP. And so one group would have normal levels of IGF-1 and the other would have a knockdown starting at 15 months of age. The IGF-1 levels are shown in these two graphs. I do apologize, males over here, females over here. And essentially, it shows exactly what we would expect to happen. The viral vectors work. They knock down IGF-1. In the, um, the wild type animal shown here, this is the normal age-related changes in IGF-1. Um, and our, the lid mouse is here, so we're taking the blood samples um, about three months of age, um, and then at 12 months and 28 months of age, and all of these are already down, okay? Uh, here's the five-month Cree right there, and uh, this animal has normal IGF-1 levels at three months of age, and then uh, at a year, they're well knocked down uh, because at five months of age, we gave that viral vector. And the same thing uh, here at the 15-month guys, um, you know, uh, we're knocking IGF-1 out at a year. It's still at a normal value. At 28 months, it's a lot less, okay? And so we can control IGF-1 is, you know, as extensively as we want, okay, um, as a function of age and after injective viral vector to knock IGF-1 down. So, um, and so that works in both males and females. And then we look at the lifespan. Make a long story short, the males are over here. Um, there's no differences with the males, okay? Um, they really don't show any changes in response to deficiency of IGF-1. I don't care whether it's a lid mouse um, or a five-month knockout of IGF-1 or a 15-month knockout of IGF-1. doesn't matter. Okay, they're, thank you very much. Compared to their control group, okay, um, they don't show any changes in how long they lived. In fact, there's a slight trend if we control for... Uh, 
uh, splenic cancer in, in these guys, that they might be shorter lived, okay, in response to a deficiency of IGF-1. The effect is all female, okay, which um, uh, uh, means I need to do more work with, with, um, with females here, and it's a surprising effect, at least to, to me, as a believer that growth hormone, you know, I'm, you know, has complex effects, but the lid mouse is the longest lived, okay, way out here, okay, and if you inject at 15 months of age, doesn't do a thing, okay, it doesn't, you know, there's no effects on how long the animals live. Okay, so you have this, the deficiency of IGF-1 in the females is an early effect. Okay, it's before 15 months of age, and I would argue it's probably even earlier than that. We don't have the resolution here to say at what age a deficiency of IGF-1 no longer works. But what it does show is that after 15 months of age, that if you have a deficiency of IGF-1, it does not affect your lifespan at all, okay? So that doesn't mean it might not be protective for certain, uh, for brain or something else. That's another question. But as far as how long the animals live, it doesn't matter after 15 months of age. It has to be before that, okay? So the interesting thing we found, too, was the effects on bone. In the male, there were not really any effects on bone, on bone mass. However, when we looked in the females that are longer lived, um, the animals that were deficient in IGF-1 had more bone. That doesn't make sense, people, okay? Bone is a target of IGF-1. It, it, it should be the opposite. Okay, I looked at this, I said, you're sure we got the groups right? We have the groups right. Okay, so, but again, look out here. At 15 months of age, it doesn't matter. Okay, you don't make, um, you don't accrue any more bone, you don't protect bone after 15 months of age with a deficiency of IGF-1. You do it five months, the animals that are deficient in IGF-1 have a lot more bone. And so do, do the lid mice. Okay. But did you know yet for the five months old if they're long lived or that's what you're waiting for for your parties when they've uh... um, we um, the five month old uh, are longer lived, yes. Okay, compared to their control group. Okay. I'm going to just conclude in two minutes. First statement. This is work out of Barkey's laboratory. This is the um, uh, Ames dwarf, it's the Ames dwarf, it's IGF concentrations in the brain in the Ames dwarf. The Ames dwarf almost has no plasma IGF-1. But look at the levels of IGF-1 that are in the brain. They are hugely elevated, okay? Both with growth hormone and IGF-1. Again, I go back to the beginning of the lecture. Is this a, is growth har, deficiency of growth hormone IGF-1 a conserved mechanism of, of aging? How can you make that conclusion if IGF-1 is not down? Okay? It doesn't work in people, and, you know, the dwarf animals that are out there actually have an increase in the paracrine levels of IGF-1. So we need to revise what we're saying and not have such a global uh, naive interpretation, okay, for, for lack of a better word, because the language is important for how we do our science, okay, and the global picture of what we're trying to say. And paracrine IGF-1 is not down. And if you think about it, and we're pursuing this now, our bone studies, Bone makes its own IGF-1. If when we lower plasma levels of IGF-1, if we have induced bone IGF-1, it would explain that. Now, I don't have that answer yet, okay? And doing IGF-1 levels in bone is going to take us six more months, okay? Because it's not an easy thing to, to, to do, because trying to pull 
that apart, okay, is challenging. We have to raise more, more mice, okay? But that's what we need to think about. What are the compensatory changes that are going on when we make these deficiencies in circulating IGF-1? And so we've talked about what we can do in the models that we have. And so, um, again, what I would say is GH and IGF-1 are not part of a conserved mechanism of aging. It's a complicated mechanism of aging that's going on that we have to piece apart piece by piece, okay? We have to take it apart to know what's going on. IGF-1 decreases with age, and these changes contribute to vasculature and brain aging. And some of these effects could be very early on that these uh, hormones are present and have a lifelong effect. Um, cognitive function, let me just skip over um, a couple of these things. Um, and, uh, and we've talked uh, a bit about the association between the growth promoting and inhibitory factors that control the uh, density of the synapse in brain. IGF-1 is a controller of, of of the plastic responses that we normally see in, in brain. Um, and then paracrine IGF-1, uh, I think, is a future direction for all of us. That if you're interested in the IGF-1 pathway, you have to be questioning paracrine I IGF-1 and what that is doing. It's going to be no longer acceptable for me or anybody else to say, oh, IGF-1 is down, therefore, blank, okay? No, you have to be looking at the expression of IGF-1 in the tissue and the binding proteins as well, which I didn't go into here, that make this a tremendously complex pathway. So with that, I'll thank all those people. Um, uh, and Zoltan and is right there, and Anna is hiding somewhere away from her husband. <laughs> um, uh, there she is. Okay. And so uh, with that, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. That was a fascinating talk and has given me lots of food for thought here. The first question that comes to mind 